Okay. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's Agile by Stealth. Uh, so I would love to work on a project like the one you just described, where you say, we're going to do Agile and we get a team in, uh, and we're, you know, we're kind of going to be Agile from the start, and we'll kind of learn and develop, and, and we'll form and storm and norm. But most of the projects um, I've worked on as a, as a freelancer uh, have been anything, anything but that. Uh, so this is about, more about Agile transformation. Um, and um, the, uh, the use of the word stealth, I had some, uh, on, on the blog, I had one guy said, no, you should never do anything by stealth. Agile's all about transparency. I'm not saying he had exactly that accent, but uh, that's how I imagine him to be very pompous about the whole thing. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, as, as hopefully you'll see. So look, let's talk about me. Um, I, I, I describe myself as a business analyst designer. Um, so I, you know, I do a lot of uh, BA type work, but I take very much a, a design perspective to it. So I'm not one of these uh, requirements gatherers. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I kind of, I guess in, in line with the, the agile ethos, I like to uh, work very collaboratively with people and we'll work together to come up with uh, what the, uh, what the solution or the change is going to be. Okay, and I'm a, a facilitator of that and I have active design ideas myself as well. But I'm also, I am able to speak to real human beings um, out there in the business. So I kind of try and meld all that together. Um, but it, it kind of feels a little bit different from the, you know, the way other people uh, describe the BRL, especially outside of Agile circles. Uh, so I'm local, like, well, from, from uh, Cheshire originally, but I've been in Yorkshire long enough now. Uh, and I've worked for a bunch of um, uh, uh, companies with a presence in Yorkshire. Um, and uh, as, as Rose says, I, uh, I, I write the, the blog in my spare time. That's my giving something back thing. So this uh, tonight's talk is, is uh, kind of a, a talky version of an article that I wrote on there earlier this year. And I do a bit of agile training as well. Um, so that's me. Uh, just let's talk about you guys. So uh, who would describe themselves as a BA in the room? Anyone? One, two, okay. Scrum masters, few developers, mostly specialising generalists, generalising specialists even. Yeah, very good. See, well, that was the right answer. I did a bit of everything. I just fit the wrong. Okay, fine. So not you. We, we know what you all are now. So, yeah, so I'm going to talk about Agile transformation. So there was a guy here uh, last week, John, uh, last month, John, who uh, works for these guys, uh, and uh, coincidentally and ironically, Roy said, yeah, these guys will be, uh, they're coming up north and you'll soon all be working for them. I start working for them in about three weeks' time. Um, and we do need another Agile BA, so if anyone's interested, see me after. Um, <laughs> that's the, the shameless plug done. Um, so John talked about uh, some, of the, uh, some of the challenges they had on, a, on an Agile transformation that they'd done and uh, it was really it was kind of inspired me to talk about this as well um, because it kind of follows on from from some of his uh, stuff he said um, and it's been hard in my experience so I'll talk a little bit about why I think that is and you know why would you why would you want to do it anyway um, and then how to do it so this is not kind of this is how it works in all situations this is actually here's my experience across three or four projects kind of melded into one semi-coherent story and you may be able to take some stuff away from it that might work for you. Um, and, uh, and the key thing is to never mention the A word whilst doing it as well. That's like a little personal challenge, a bit like my other personal challenge, never to mention the word requirements on a project. Um, so, so that's the agenda. OK, so let's kick off. So, so first of all, and obviously I'm preaching to some extent, or hopefully to a large extent, to the converted here. But just as a quick reminder, because it's always good to remind yourself why you're trying to do something. So why would I want to transform away from a waterfall type project delivery method to something more agile? Um, and thinking what's frustrating or wrong about waterfall really helps when you're thinking about the transformation. So for me, the big first thing, this has got a laser on it. How do you think I do the laser? Ah, wait a minute. Ta -da! So scope bloat. Okay, so there's a lot of when we talk about Agile, we talk a lot about uh, early and continuous and frequent delivery of high value software and the feedback loop and all that kind of stuff. For me, that stuff is all important, but there's one thing that, um, that gets talked about less frequently, and it is one of the Agile principles, and it's um, the art of simplicity. Yeah? Um, 
So maximizing the amount of work not done. So my experience on big projects is that when you start a project and you say, oh, I've got a budget, got a million quid or a hundred quid or a thousand quid or whatever we've got, what do you want? What's in scope? The objective is this, now what should we build? And you, you know, you kind of wheel in everyone who might be a stakeholder and they go, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And you write all these things down and you end up with a massive scope list like this. And, and it's particularly symptomatic of, of a waterfall project because everyone thinks, oh shit, if I don't, um, can I swear? I just did. So if, um, if I don't ask for this thing now, I'll never get it. They're going to build this thing once and once only. And my thing that I want is going to be, it's got to be in there, okay? So even if I'm not really sure whether I need it or it's low priority, I've got to get it on the list. And so you end up with this massive scope list like this. And one of the key things that's wrong, and you know, people talk about uh, projects failing sort of 60% of the time. For me, I think this is a biggie. I think this is the big, hang on, laser thing again. Scope look, I think, is, is, is a bigger problem than, than we all think, okay? So that's why it's at the top. Second of all, then, so all the rest of the stuff you'll definitely all agree with. It's slow and laborious. It takes ages before you get anything delivered, okay? Architectural risks don't come up until quite late on. They don't get resolved until quite late on. Functional risks. So you build it, and, and then you only get to show it to the users in UAT, and by which time, you know, you spent all this time building it, and they go, oh, yeah, I know I said I wanted that, but uh, now I see it. I want something different. So functional risks only come out late on. It resists change, we, we, we're familiar with that. Um, the cost and duration is uncertain, so we'll have a plan that says it will take this long and it will cost this much, but it never actually will because by the time we finish, we'll have had that many change requests through that it will have taken a lot longer and it will have cost a load more as well. So it doesn't actually have much certainty, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, resource leveling as well. So in Waterfall, you've got your, you know, your BA up front and he's really busy, he or she or they are really busy for a while. And then, right, okay, we've got the design, or the, you know, the, the, the things we want to build. And then uh, we've got the you know, build team, build, and then you've got tests. So the big humps of, of activity. And the rest of the time, people are either sitting idle or more likely they've been <coughs> shunted off onto other projects. So you know, they're not all there at the same time. So you lose the expertise from your, from your BA, and uh, half your developers disappear during tests, so on and so forth. Yeah, that's really frustrating. And then tied in with all of that stuff, team motivation. So big, long project, don't deliver anything for ages, resist change, uh, cut corners, project manager getting angry, team motivation not so good. So we are all presumably familiar with a lot of those things. Ah. Uh, so that's just a reminder. So it's good to do that. Why am I trying to do it? But um, agile, agile scary for a lot of people, and especially people who've been working in plan-driven environments, large organizations for a while. And uh, I've got this kind of, uh, this analogy, which I'll share with you. It might work for you, it might not. Um, so imagine a world where uh, we live in a communist state. So uh, we decided the best way to organize our uh, country economy is to have it planned centrally, okay? So this is the project managers in charge now. And um, so right, well, this, this makes a lot of sense. We'll kind of, you guys can do that and you can do that and there'll be handoffs between there and there and you can build that, you build that and we'll, we'll plan it all out and then uh, that should work. Uh, and, then, and then it doesn't work that well as history has told. Um, and it turns out, apologies if there are any communists in the room, are there any communists in the room? <laughs> Oof, could have been a big clang in there, couldn't it? Um, it turns out that a, a, a free market-based economy seems to work a lot better, even though it sounds like a crazy idea. So we'll set up multiple companies all doing the same thing. We'll have several supermarkets. We'll have several uh, trainer shops. We'll have several uh, whatever else. We'll have several of everything, and they'll all compete with one another. That just sounds massively wasteful, doesn't it? It just sounds like a bad idea. And yet, it creates the right dynamics in the set of incentives to make things work, but it's counterintuitive almost until you've actually seen it in action. And I think, does that work as an analogy for Agile? Yeah. Is anyone getting that? Good, was that you? Yeah. Thank that you. Was exciting. Thank you. Right, okay. <laughs> okay, you've, you've, you've gone above where I was expecting to get to, but good, thank you. So, so but that's the point, isn't it? It kind of sounds counterintuitive if you're, if you're used to planning things out. You know, planning uh, makes sense. And we'll, 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 we'll work it, we'll design, then we'll build, then, you know, it just seems to, seems to make sense. Agile, uh, what do you mean we don't know what the scope is yet? You, you know, uh, what do you mean you don't know when you'll be finished? Uh, and we'll, we'll definitely have to do some rework, we're going to have to refactor stuff. 
you know, c couldn't we just get it right first time? So, you know, when you explain Agile to, to people who are not used to it, they, it's, it's, it's scary. It sounds like a recipe for disaster. A, a project manager friend of mine says, well, failing to plan is planning to fail. So, the safety of plans. <laughs> plans give the illusion of certainty, don't they? They sort of kind of say, right, yeah, we're going to do this and this and this, and then we'll be done. And we know what we're doing, when we'll be done, and how much it will cost, but it is just an illusion, yeah? Um, and why is it an illusion? Because estimating software delivery tasks is just so hard. Every team's different. Everyone's always mostly optimistic because it always feels like it'll be quicker than it actually takes. Um, and also getting it right first time is really hard because only when you show it to the user do they then think, oh, that wasn't really what I wanted. And the business changes <coughs> and so on and so forth. So, so the plan gives you the impression that you know what you're doing when actually you don't. So, so here's, a, here's a story. Six months ago, uh, I, uh, in fact, it's longer than that now. It's last April. I started on a project, and, <coughs> um, and uh, it started already, and it had all the hallmarks of a, well, every project I've probably ever worked on, to be honest. So it had a load of scope, way too much scope, more scope than you actually needed to achieve the project's objectives. And it looked like things were, it was a data project, and data always changes, always data quality issues and stuff like that. So it was, you know, it, it looked like it would, things would change as we went along. The deadline was fixed, and I'd just done a project exactly the same, very, very similar. And, um, and on the previous project, we, we kind of nailed it by doing a phased delivery. Okay? We wouldn't have called it agile in a kind of XP, scrummy kind of the way. Uh, but it was, we were definitely on phased delivery. And we were prioritizing and delivering stuff bit by bit. And it was working really, really well. So, so I went, hey, guys, I'm new in. You don't really know who I am, and you don't trust me. But I've just done this, something really, really similar. And uh, what we should really do on this is phase delivery, OK? I didn't, didn't say agile. Let's do phase delivery. And they kind of looked at me and went, well, we don't know who you are. And we're not really sure about you. So uh, no, you're wrong. We'll just carry on as we are. Um, so the proposal was, was not back. It was rejected. I was still. So I still worked on the project, uh, and over the last nine months or so, I've kind of done a sort of repeat of what I had to do last time, actually, which was rather than just go in and say, right, we'll, we'll do this agile thing like you guys got to do straight off, we, uh, I, I kind of said, OK, well, we'll do this one step at a time then, stealth style, sunglasses on. So um, agile by stealth. So. Um, Here's the thing, uh, and I, I said before about stealth. So it's not really about being stealthy and deceitful. This it's it's about rather going on a step-by-step -step journey, okay, where each step along the way is only a, it's a small enough step that your people around you are willing to take that step with you, uh, with a little bit of kicking and screaming maybe, um, but each each step kind of has a merit in its own right. So you can say, well, why don't we why don't we do this? And, and we'll do this because, um, and you, you, know, you can justify in its own right, uh, whilst at the back of your mind, having an idea of where you're trying to get to, um, but kind of not all at once. So the all at once approach didn't work. So, um, so risk mitigation turns out to be uh, your friend in this, uh, in this endeavor. Um, so uh, as you'll see in various of the steps, uh, it, it's kind of, it's possible to introduce changes by saying, well, there's a risk that, uh, so maybe we should do this. So uh, that, that'll play out as we, as we go through the step by step. Um, one of the key things was, as I said, not trying to introduce everything all at once, uh, but only when the time was right. So I had to, had to go through a few steps before I was able to present the next step. You know, if I presented, right, here's my, here's my plan, here are all the steps we're going to go through up front, then it, everyone would have been, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Uh, you're just trying to do that phase thing again bit by bit, aren't you? So uh, th that was a sort of stealthy bit was saying, well, I'm not going to introduce this all at one go. We're going to go introduce each idea when, when the time's right, OK? Uh, and most importantly is you can't mention the A word. And, and any of the, the buzz, you mentioned buzzwords as well, didn't you? So any of the kind of buzzwords that go around, as soon as you start talking about stories and MVPs, and um, you know any of the other cool terminology, the you know the, the kind of the the, the non-agile folks. Go, well, no, you're trying to do that agile thing again, aren't you? But if you use uh, normal non-agile words, that effectively mean the same thing. Then it's like, okay, I get that. Features. That sounds like a good idea. 
Yeah, it sounds much better than that stories idea. It's the same thing. Um, so, uh, and if anyone says you're trying to go agile, you have to actively deny it, of course. I am playing this up a little bit for comedy effect, but you know, you get the idea. So, 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 um, as I said, um, my, as well as doing a bit of agile training and a bit of kind of team leading, scrum mastery type stuff, the main thing that I've done in the last few projects has been kind of agile BA with a bit of solution design architecture type stuff thrown in. And the approach that I'm going to show you is largely a BA driven approach. You'll see why when you see the steps. So it helps to be the BA. So you're in a good position and there was someone else as well. Um, and everyone else, you, uh, it's harder uh, if you don't have the BA on board. So I worked on another project where the BA was oh, always, it was hard work. So I was trying to say, well, let's, do, let's break it down into features. No, no, I'll, just, I'll just write this big long spec. Oh, no, no, no. So it's, it's quite difficult without um, uh, the BA buy-in. Uh, but a project manager or, well, you wouldn't be a scrum master if it wasn't an agile environment, would you? But it's, it's possible to do it as a project manager if you can persuade the BA to, uh, to get involved. And likewise, if you're kind of a tech lead or dev lead or that kind of role, if you can persuade the BA to work in this sort of way, then it works as well. Anyway, see what you think, see what you think. Um, here we go, step one, step one. Right, so there's, there's quite a lot of steps. Uh, we're aiming for, what do we say, five two, ten two, five two. There's about 15 steps, so I've got two minutes per step, and probably a bit less, because there's a few bits after that as well. So let's fire through. Some of this stuff will look fairly familiar. So as a BA on a project, starting off, the first thing you want is a kind of a scope list, okay? And I've done this uh, kind of fresh onto a project, and also when a project's been in flight, so a couple of projects have been on and been in flight already with a big long requirements document that's kind of half finished. Uh, so either extracting the scope out of people's heads from scratch or taking a big long document and working through it and saying, right, I can chunk it up into, I'll call them features, and, that, and that'll be a scope list. So no one, in any environment really can, can argue with the concept of having a very simple and easy list of project scope as it is currently known. And on a waterfall project, they would say, well, that is the project scope, okay? So here we go. And I'll give them all numbers, and I'll start them with F because they're features. And I'll give them a name, and I'll give them a description. And I won't use the as a I can so that notation because that's way too agile. And I won't call them stories. And I won't worry too much about granularity either. So um, obviously one of the one of the techniques um, on Agile teams is having epics and splitting them into stories and sto so forth. This is my first step where I'm just getting the scope all down, okay? I'm not too worried about the granularity. So there's my a set of example um, stories for some kind of uh, online shoppy type thing. Register, login, browse products, and so on and so forth, yeah? So I've got some, I've got some features, not stories, features. So step two, uh, and again, no, no project manager would deny, deny you this. We say, well, I think we should have a bit of a, an estimation exercise and see how big this scope is. Um, you know, we, we, we need to build a plan, don't we? So uh, we need a Gantt chart. We need to have some idea of how big these things are. So let's do some estimation. Uh, now, um, I've, again, steered clear of the idea of using story points or some kind of relative measure initially or certainly badging it as that, because again, everyone goes, well, I, need, I need to be able to draw a plan in man days. So story points doesn't work for me. I need real man days. So I said, okay, well, let's estimate in man days then. And um, so work down, oh yeah, that one's 10, that's five, that's 15, so on and so forth, work down them. And then at the end of the, the session on this project, so okay, well, so there's a man days, but I think uh, you've probably given me those estimates in perfect man days, haven't you? And we all know that no man day is perfect. So uh, we need to add in some contingency, which is kind of standard project management uh, approach. Uh, and I think based on my previous experience, uh, I think we should add 50% in. I know that sounds like a lot, but I think we should add in 50% because um, there'll be a lot of imperfect days. Now, my past experience actually is that it will be closer to 100% contingency. So um, Kent Beck, 99, OT 99 said, Whatever your estimate is, double it. He always said double it, and I was like, no, no, you can't double it. it was, every project I've done since then, when I've worked it out, it's been roughly right. Double, double the initial estimate. Anyway, for now, 
They'll call them perfect mandates. We'll add on 50% contingency because no one will stick 100% contingency. They just wouldn't. No, 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 no. It can't be that much more. It can't be that bad at estimating. And then we'll add on some extra effort for, for analysis and tests. So we get a kind of a total number of mandates, and then I can turn that into a budget. And bingo, we've got a plan. We've got a plan, and roughly we've got a budget. Okay. So again, so far, so not agile. Okay. Just standard. Uh, normal project estimation. Okay, so the next thing then is, I'll say, right, well, I'm going to start working on the analysis for this project now, um, and I can't do all the analysis all at once. I'm going to knock these features off one at a time. I'm going to work on them in some kind of order. So in order to do that, I don't want to work on them in a random order. I want to get them prioritized. So I'm working on the most important features first, okay? Um, so uh, I want you, Mr. Stakeholder or Mr. We won't call them a product owner, but I need some people in the room from the business who are interested in this thing to tell me what order, roughly, what's most important, what's least important. And I'll just start working on the most important features first. I'm still going to do all this analysis up front before we, uh, before we start any development, but I just want to make sure, just in case, now there's a risk forming in my mind here, it might take me a bit longer than we've got in our plan. We've planned four weeks or six weeks or whatever we've planned for this analysis now. What if it took me a bit longer? and I hadn't finished, and we needed to start development. If I start working on the most important things first, then we could, after six weeks, if I haven't finished, because things just took a bit longer, uh, we could start development on time, at risk, admittedly, but we could start on time because, you know, they can start working on the stuff that I finished, yeah? Okay, so it's a risk mitigation. We could even put a risk on the risk register that says there's a risk that analysis might take longer than expected. And the risk mitigation is to prioritize the uh, scope, the stories then, the features, uh, and work on them in priority order for that very reason. So risk mitigation could be your friend on this, okay? Uh, so I'm not going to do Moscow. I'm not going to do must, should, could, and won't, because they'll immediately start smelling D-scope at that point, won't they? Like, okay, so you say that's a won't or a would or whatever. Okay, I can see where this is heading. So no, 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 I don't need must, should, could, and won't. I just need them stack ranked so I know what's most important. Let's go, let's go first. I'm not looking to descope anything. I'm definitely not grooming, well, it's not a backlog anyway, and I'm definitely not grooming it. When I talked to my project manager today about, he, he said, uh, well, so what would you say your job description is? One of the things I do is groom the backlog. That's becoming a creepier and creepier thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> you know, he said, um, he kind of mentioned Jimmy Savile, and it all went downhill from there. Um, but, um, you know, again, agile terminology doesn't work for everyone. Um, so, so, okay, I've got my features, I've prioritised them, I'm going to go a little bit crazy now and start to appear very slightly agile by putting them up on the wall, on a task board, okay? Um, so, and I'm going to put them in my priority order. Um, but I don't have any columns yet because I've not actually done any work yet. I've just got a list of prioritized features. I just kind of want them up there so I can see them and love them and get excited about them in advance. And any of my stakeholders passing can make sure they're all still in the right, right priority order. Okay? Uh, so up they go. Hopefully, I've got a very tall, thin wall in order to get them all in because any project <coughs> that's bigger than 10 features, I'm going to have a big vertical pile. But I can, you know, maybe I could, have, I could have a snake or something like that. So there are my features. I've put my little uh, uh, perfect Monday estimates in the corner as well. It just gives me an idea of how big these things are relative to one another. So I've got an idea on maybe how long the analysis is going to take. Step four, 29 minutes past. Okay, we're doing all right, I think. I think we're doing all right. So, okay, I've stated an intention to work on these things bit by bit, feature by feature, <laughs> incrementally. So that's what I'm going to do now. As I said, as a risk mitigation, I'm going to work through feature by feature. Now, without getting into too much detail, this is my um, kind of mini analysis life cycle, if you like. So I go through this process of request, which is like, you know, the feature gets created and added to the list in the initial scoping thing. Uh, and then it sits there for a while, it's a little clocky thing. And then for me, define is like, all right, well, I've just got a, literally a paragraph on this thing. Let's understand a bit more what it is. Because um, although we've maybe done some estimates on this, I, I really need to understand it in a bit more detail. And maybe there's different options for how we might achieve it. Is it system build? Is it business process? Is it a mixture of the two? Is it going to be automated, manual? How's it going to be? So I call that define. 
and they include in that whole lot of um, <coughs> options analysis and also feature splitting. So if, if it turns out it's a really big feature, that's the point where I might say, well, we'll do it in two phases because, um, well, for all sorts of reasons, one of the main one would be that I realized that uh, this feature's got some really important stuff in it and then some less important stuff in it. So I want to give myself the ability to sub-prioritize. So actually what that means is I'm going to carve out a phase one, which is the stuff I think we probably need in, in the minimum viable product. And then a the phase two stuff, I'm going to put in a and here's everything else feature. And then at some point, hopefully, we'll prioritize that down the prioritization list. So I do that in define. And then the bit that I call design is, is kind of functional specification uh, or BDD scenarios or acceptance criteria or however you want to get to the point of saying this is our contract for what we're, what we're going to build and what we're going to test against and what we're going to deliver. So that's a kind of high levels-y type stuff and that's a bit more details-y functional design, not kind of technical design. And I might do uh, logical data models and wireframes as well at that point if, uh, if they're appropriate in the environment. So, uh, so that's me doing incremental analysis feature by feature, uh, including feature splitting. Okay, so um, once I start doing that, then I'm going to start feeling the need for columns. Okay, so previously I just had one column on my taskboard, but now I've got the concept of features being in, in this defined phase, defined complete, ready to start the design phase. I'm a little bit, I get a bit carried away with some of this stuff sometimes. It's in the design phase and it's design complete. Ooh, ready for build. Oh, no, no, not ready for build yet because we're, we're going to finish it all before we start building, aren't we? Unless I'm running late. So, so my task board now starts to look ooh, a little bit more like, oh, it's one of those agile boardy things he's doing there, isn't it? No, 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 it's not an agile board. It's just me tracking my progress on a board. Okay. So once I've started doing incremental analysis, I can start tracking my velocity. So project managers going to be really interested to know when am I going to be finished? And I always say, well, how long is a piece of string? But I can, can I have a go because we've put some estimates against the features, which admittedly are build estimates. They're not analysis estimates. But roughly speaking, a feature that's big to build could be big to analyze. It's not always true, but, you know, as a rule of thumb, uh, the small ones might be quick to analyze and the big ones might be slower. Okay. Uh, so I could do my velocity by using the, the PMD estimates I had. So once feature A, feature, feature one's complete or analysis complete, then... Um, you know, I can say, well, that was, I don't know, 10 perfect man days. So, hey, in the first week, I got 10. And the next week, I did really well. I got up to 50 uh, and so on and so forth. So I, over the one, two, three, four weeks, um, well, you can start to see a trend here. I could draw, I could extend, extrapolate that line out there. And because my total scope is 200 of these perfect man days, I'm going to be analysis complete around about there you know and then the, the project manager takes that exact date and takes it as a concrete commitment to when i'll be finished of course um but um uh, you know that may or may not be the planned completion date and if it's if it is great if it's not then he's going to think oh right, okay so we're going to push the project to the right here or oh, we could always start development early what we're going to do so we, we've got some information early on about how we're really doing on analysis okay based on actual um, estimates of how I'm doing. So that's, that's step six. So step seven, okay, here's the first sneaky bit. This is the where the, where the sunglasses go on. Um, proof of concept. So I've now done some analysis on, uh, on a bunch of features and I've realized that some of them look a little I like them as some kind of novelty or, you know, some, something that's not run of the mill. Either architecturally, technically, so it looks like some technical complexity there, uh, or, or maybe functionally. So I say, well, you know, this, this doesn't exist in the marketplace currently. Um, it's new. And so, you know, there's a, there's a, we'll have a guess at how, how this could work, but when people get to use it, that's when we'll really discover. So, hey, um, maybe, maybe we should look at doing a proof of concept. Um, so I know this is a bit of a novel idea in a waterfall world where I'm still in design, but I'm just thinking that there's a risk here. Again, the risk register is my friend here. There's a risk that, um, that, that, that uh, some of this might be a bit tricky. So what about a proof of concept? Um, and so this is a conversation with the project manager, obviously. And so oh, let's get some developers in. Let's get a, just one or two guys or gals in and um, uh, get them working on this proof of concept. And then uh, here's a couple of extra bonuses. 
uh, they could participate in the analysis. So one of the things I find frustrating early on in projects is no developers there. There's no one really to validate whether the things we're proposing to build are technically, technically feasible. You know, they fit in with the incumbent uh, extant uh, architecture and so on and so forth. So if we got them in, uh, they could do that. They could start getting the environments ready for when build starts. You know, we could just kind of steal a march. So, um, and then the proof of concepts, you know, if you say, well, it's, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of effort, you know, we could potentially uh, build it. And then if, it, if it's good, we could build on top of it. So it could be productionized potentially, okay? Uh, so if, if, if I get agreement to this, then I'll, I'll, um, I'll say, okay, either one of my features that I've already got is the subject of the proof of concept, or maybe I'll carve out some part of one of those features that I've already worked out what it's going to be, and we'll use that as a subject of a POC. And we'll, we'll take that feature through a life cycle in miniature. We'll build it. We probably won't test it formally at this point, but we'll show it. We'll definitely show it, kind of some kind of UAT or show and tell or something like that to the business if, if we think that, that works. So, yeah, let's do that. So that's, that's step seven. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll get some feedback from the users on it as well, and we'll, we'll learn something from that. OK. Step eight, then, hot on the heels of proof of concept. So if I managed to get some uh, developers in, and they've started doing some build work on a proof of concept, and they finish that, and they're budgeted to the project already, and they're twiddling their thumbs, and hey, hang on a minute, I just had an idea. Um, we, uh, I've got a bunch of features here that have, have been analysed. I've done the, 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 I've worked out what we're going to do. They accepted the criteria, <coughs> and um, they're ready to go. They could start build on those. They could actually start build early, and that would mitigate the risk of development potentially taking longer than we thought as well, wouldn't it? We could steal a march. So, um, uh, so. Obviously, now the big challenge that comes at here is, well, hang on a minute, you've not finished all the analysis. What if you get over there and you realise that that bit over there would need to change and we've done it wrong? That's wasted effort then, isn't it? Do you know what? You're right. You're right. It could be. There is a risk of rework. So to mitigate that, let's choose a feature that we're pretty sure isn't going to change. It's something that we're all fairly certain on. It's not too novel. Uh, it doesn't look like it'd be impacted by the other areas. It's fairly standalone. We could get started on that. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, maybe... I could say, well, look, we did a proof of concept and uh, a few changes came out of that, didn't it? So maybe uh, there is a risk of re rework, but we'll only find out once we've built it. So maybe we should build some more stuff early and find out what's going to change. Because I've got some proof here that things can change and we, we need to react to that. Uh, it's better to get started as soon as possible. Um, but you, we're not, this is not an agile project, okay? This is still a waterfall project. We're just doing proof of concept. That's, that's standard stuff. And we're, we're mitigating risk by starting development early. Now, if I get to do that, if I do start building, or when I do start building, even if I don't get to start early, I can start measuring build velocity, okay? So feature by feature, if we, uh, and, and this is a big if, of course, if we get the developers to work feature by feature and, and, and finish one feature <laughs> off, each before starting another one and limiting their work in progress, which I, that, that's a struggle actually, because oh, this is almost done. And I'll start on this thing, I'll start on that thing. And um, you know, we end up with a lot of stuff almost done, but not quite done. But if we can persuade them to uh, finish stuff off, we can start tracking how that's going, okay? So standard burn up type stuff here. You know, in that week we've got this much done, in that week we've got, these aren't sprints of course, because we're not doing sprints, because we're not, we're not doing scrum, they're no, weeks. But week by week, I can see things improving. And maybe I can start putting this up in the team area and kind of using it as a, as a driver, a motivator to say, look, guys, we've got to get up here. Uh, so, um, you know, and only when you get features complete do you get points. Uh, and points, points maybe make prizes, I don't know. Um, but we can start tracking that progress, uh, actual progress. And after we've done it for a few weeks, then I can see that there's a trend emerging. You know, it's a bit jaggedy, but if I average it out over that many weeks, then there's a line that looks roughly like this. And hey, that's going to hit that scope line. We're going to be build complete on there sometime in October, towards the end of October. So that's our, our first real... Well, we had a planned date, of course. So we had a planned date, which said, I don't know, end of September. But hey, hang on a minute. This thing here says, looks like it's going to take longer than that. And this is based on actual fact, okay? Uh, so, you know, the, the, the truth doesn't lie. So once we get this, this is our first hint as to whether we're on plan or not, yeah? Um, and this is really powerful in my, in my experience, you know, when we've done this. 
uh, this, this was the thing that started, this is where the behaviour really started changing and things started cascading. This was the start of the, uh, the, the move, as it were, you know, the mindset change. So what happens then, of course, is the project manager goes, oh, pants, we're not going to be, we're not, we're not going to be on plan here, okay? Uh, we're going to be delayed and there's a, there's a fixed, uh, fixed deadline here. Well, we need to do some replanning. Right? That's the, the kind of project management answer to, to problems like this. We'll replan and we'll replan so that it all fits. So then we'll go through this frenzy of uh, re-scoping and reprioritizing, re-estimating everything. And in the re-scoping and reprioritizing, the business will say exactly as they did at the beginning of the project, which is, yeah, of course we need all that stuff. Yeah? And it's all really important. You can't de-scope any of it. We need all of it in order to achieve this objective, including all of those things that we don't really need. But we know if we don't ask for them now, we won't get them. Okay? So nothing comes out of scope at this point. And also the developers understand a bit more about what they've got to do and they realise that some of these things are actually bigger than they thought. So uh, the more you know, the more your estimate goes up, right? Okay. So uh, we redo the perfect mandates, hoping that maybe something will go down, but actually the opposite happens. The, the estimates go up. Now, I know this is, you know, if you're kind of a, a mature agile team, you don't redo your estimates, okay? You stick with the same level of... of um, understanding about the, pro the, the problem so that your, your estimates are always consistent with one another. But here we, we're kind of, we've let that go a little bit because uh, we, we want to prove a point here. So, so actually, this happens, scope goes up and the deadline goes out. Holy crap, it's going to be the middle of November before we're finished now. I've got to have this build complete by, by the end of September. That replanning didn't quite go as planned. Um, so this, this then is the crunch point, okay? The crunch point is somebody, the business stakeholder or the, uh, the project manager says, okay, I agree, the, the, the graph isn't lying to me. This is telling me when we actually are going to be finished and it looks like it's a bigger job than we thought. So what can we have? I know I said it was all absolutely mandatory, this game, but what could we have on the original date? Yeah, if we are sticking to that date, what could we have? And this is the point where we go, aha, aha, oh, okay. So you're saying... I told you so, T-shirt hidden under here. So you're saying it's not all absolutely essential and we could maybe deliver a subset of it, an initial phase. Okay. Well, let's have a look. Let's go back to that prioritization thing then and let's see, you know, w which of these things could you maybe manage without for an initial phase? We'll still deliver them, of course, phase two, but let's call it phase one. What should we aim for phase one? And by the way, we want to be build complete on phase one, well, end, of, end of November, uh, end of September. And so that's the first kind of chink in the armour of the business where they finally go, all right, okay, okay, I admit there's a few things in there that maybe we could manage without in phase one and we could deliver a little bit later. So, aha, starting to sound a little bit like a minimal viable product, but we wouldn't call it that, of course, we'd call it phase one. Um, so, so, yeah, this is a big, big step, okay, in the step-by-step um, -step plan. Moving from we'll do it all at once to there's a phase one, makes a big change. So suddenly you get this, this change in the project dynamics. So suddenly prioritization is no longer uh, it's in or it's out. And well, it's just because he wants to do that bit first. But we're going to get it all. So it doesn't really, we don't really care what the prioritization is. Suddenly, shit, it matters. Because if it's not in phase one, I don't get it in my initial go live. Okay. So suddenly I really care about the prioritization. So suddenly it becomes much more fun doing prioritization. And um, uh, it, you really have to have phase two as the do it later bucket to get the, to the truth of what's essential for phase one. Um, so, yeah, we're asking the question, what will fit in phase one? What, what can we fit in rather than I want all of these things? The question really changes. And, and here's the irony, and this has happened at, at least a couple of projects. I, I kind of had to prove we were going to fail before I could get the change in behavior. So I had to prove that we wouldn't deliver on time with actual facts, you know, the burn-up charts. And look, this shows you we're not going to deliver on time before they go, OK, all right, two phases. Two phases. We need two phases. And we can, we can prioritize stuff. Um, and th as I say, the burn-up charts have been abso absolutely, absolutely essential for this. Um, you know, the power of historic fact versus future optimism. Because when you're working to a plan, you know, and you go, well, we're a bit behind. Do you know what? We'll just have to speed up. We'll just have to work a little bit harder and a little bit faster for these last few weeks and then we'll make it on time and you never do do you? you never it's just it just doesn't happen 
in that way. You know, you're just really optimistic until the Thursday before the Friday deadline. Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to have this 20 more man days worth of work done tomorrow. And then, and then you don't. Um, whereas this kind of, well, this is how fast we've been going. We're going to have the same number of men next week and women next week as we had last week. You know, maybe we can get some incremental um, efficiency improvements, but, uh, but really probably not. And by the way, we haven't even started... Um, we're doing build, we haven't started test yet, so there's going to be a whole bunch of defect rework that's going to come in and probably slow the velocity down rather than speed it up. So, so yeah, uh, the, the burn-up chart, I can't, I can't emphasise how, how useful that's been. I can't overemphasise that enough. So, okay, so we've got this, uh, we've got this phase one, phase two thing, and then what's going to happen, or probably has already happened in parallel with this, is change. So... Maybe we've finished some features, we've shown them to the, the business and they've gone, well, okay. See, that's what I said I wanted, but um, yeah, that's not going to work, is it? So, that, that, you know, that, that's going to have to change. Uh, so either, you know, they raise a bunch of defects and, and claim that, um, you know, it, it, it's a defect. And, well, that's what you wanted. Anyway, so change happens one way or another, uh, or, you know, time's passed and the business changes. All, all the reasons that change might happen. And, and that becomes... Really easy, of course, with, uh, when you're managing a backlog, because each change is a new feature or a new story. We're, we're not feature, not stories. A new feature. Great. You want that thing? We'll add it on. And next time we do the prioritization session, you tell me where it fits relative to everything else. Because you know how fast we can go already. Um, uh, you know, we could upscale the team a little bit, but there's, there's limits. But, you, you know, you know it, it, it's your choice. You know, you put the power in the, in the hands of the business. Classic sort of agile type stuff. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so here's the thing about, uh, it, it, now this is where the challenge comes in, of course, because uh, if you're on a waterfall type project with a waterfall type financials where you've gone to change board up front and you've got your million pound budget for your project, you know, um, the project manager go, well, that, that's change. We haven't got the budget for that. Uh, you can't introduce that change into the project without raising a change request, okay? So a change request is a 10 page document, of course. Uh, and, and in the change request, you have to describe exactly what it is you're going to do differently before you've even done the analysis to work out what it is, how you're going to solve the problem. It does my head in. Um, and uh, so, so the sleight of hand here, which is still part of, this is, this is, yeah, this is part of step 12 still. So there's a, there's a little trick here, um, which is that you let, so ch you know, business stakeholders decide we're going to need this thing. So, okay, I can add that to the backlog. Uh, sorry, the feature list. The backlog and I can add the features to the list, but I'm going to have to mark it as not in scope brackets yet, okay? Because there's no budget for that feature. It's not in scope yet. It can go on, but it's not formally in scope. We'll estimate it and prioritize it. Uh, and, um, you know, if that's going into phase two, hey, just, we'll worry about the change request later because we're working on phase one for now. Now, if you want to put that in phase one, oh, well, kind of, you know, we, we're fixed on a deadline for that. So uh, if you want to put that in, then something else has to come out or, you know, we have to change the date. So you then, you know, you can get into a bit of a discussion about that. And then at some point, you're going to have to actually go back to the change board for more money. So usually, you know, you get a bucket of 10 of these features or 20 or whatever, and then you buy one big CR that says, we want to deliver these additional features, da, 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 and we've already estimated them, we know how big they are, and it's like this. And, you, you know, you, rather than going piecemeal bit by bit on, as you normally do you go in a big chunk when really the change controls happened informally within the project and then you've got this formal process with the with the the people with the with the uh, the wallets six minutes left okay so um slice of hand with regards to change control um and and related to change as well so here's the thing i don't know if you've seen this idea before but rather than a horizontal scope line which says scope won't change. So here's, here's where I am at the minute. Here's my point in time now. My scope line slopes upwards like this because I know change is coming. I don't know what it is yet, but I know it's coming. So really, honestly, I, I ain't going to be finished till the end of, of, of November or, or even into December, you know, because it's not there, it, it's there. And then the project manager said, we will clamp down really hard on change. So I say, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll draw it like this, okay? There's your flat line. There's your flat line that you're going to clamp down on change. And there's my, you know, worst, let's call that worst case. Let's say in the worst case. So we've got a range of dates. So we've got some uncertainty here. We'll, we'll be build complete between there and there. And I love that as well. I love the uncertainty thing because it's, it's, there is uncertainty. 
plans always kind of give you a date, don't they? So we'll be finished then. Uh, and this says, do you know what? We're not sure. We're actually not sure. Uh, it's a range. And if you get really clever with this, you can do like, you know, best case and worst case velocity as well. And, and it makes the range even wider as well. And it explicitly represents the fact that there is uncertainty. <coughs> I like that. Uh, okay, so we've got two phases. And we're go great guns on phase one. We're getting to the point where phase one is close to being delivered. Or, you know, there's certainly some certainty around it. And our attention switches into phase two. Okay, phase two. That looks good. Wow, there's a whole load of shit in phase two now, isn't there? All these other changes that we added in, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, well, what we're gonna do, when's that going to be ready then? When's phase two going to be ready? Uh, so, and at this point, I said, well, I'll tell you what, you know, we could maybe, we could do that phase thing again, couldn't we? So rather than trying to do all of that all in one go, maybe we could break this down. We could, I don't know, deliver on a regular basis, perhaps. Maybe we could deliver something every three months. Every two months, maybe every, every four weeks. I don't know. It depends on you know, how, what the fast, how fast the project's going. But the concept of regular delivery. And hey, we've, we already know roughly how big these, things, these features are. So we'll scope out the next phase. We already know things can change. Um, so let's scope out the next phase. And we'll kind of leave it a little bit vague after then. But we know roughly how big everything is. Um, and, then, and then we'll do it. Like, how about that? And at this point, because we've already done the two phases thing, everyone's a little bit more receptive to the idea of end phases. So going from two phases, going from one phase to two is the hard thing, and going from two phases to end phases is a bit easier. Um, we did this on the project I'm working on at the minute. It was, it was interesting. Uh, I kind of said, well, let, well let, next phase we'll deliver then. But we sort of weirdly kind of melded into a, without really trying, into Kanban. We started, you know, we deliver stuff into live when it's ready, feature by feature. We didn't even plan that, it just kind of happened. And we eventually went, oh, we're not doing phases, are we? We're just doing it bit by bit. Anyway, that was even better. Yeah, so because I've got my perfect man days and my velocity already, planning those things out becomes really quite easy. It just takes a matter of minutes. So phase delivery, there you go, step 13. We are three minutes left and two more steps. Okay, so trim the tail. So, uh, you know, roll on six months and we've still got a massive backlog and we've delivered four phases already and there's no sign of the end in sight, but... Uh, lo and behold, we seem to have delivered the vast majority of our business objectives without delivering all this low-value shit down here. Whoa! Um, so whoever's got the purse strings might at this point go, ka you know, thanks, uh, we, we ain't doing that stuff. Or, um, as what's happening with the current project is, we're going from project delivery mode, ramping down into a kind of a support slash BAU slash DevOps type model. So it's not like the tail's getting trimmed, but it's just becoming, it's becoming longer. We're... We're transitioning over into uh, having a support team that can deliver stuff off a backlog, lock, backlog uh, you know, I guess DevOpsy, Kanban-y type thing. So, yeah, at some point the project budget gets gets uh, uh, gets chopped. Um, so that's step 14. So that, by the way, you know, I said at the beginning, scope bloat was the thing that that uh, for me is the biggest killer. And that step four, we had to go through 14 steps to get to the hatchet that cut. The stuff off the bottom because up until now I've not descoped a single thing I've never said we're never going to do that I've just said we'll do that when it's the most important thing to do that's one of the things I love about a backlog is you never have to say no really you know a lot of people talk about good product owners will say no but you know uh, it, it's also possible to not say no and say well that's fine when do you want it you know which is when's it most important so so this is the first time we, we descoped anything and we're, we're six eight months in by which time the business stakeholders have just had enough anyway. Like, I don't want that shit anymore. Um, so step 15, repeat and improve. So where have we got to? Okay, so you might say, well, that doesn't sound very agile. I don't see any two-week sprints. I don't see any, uh, I didn't hear you do any, re any retrospectives or any pair programming. Uh, I didn't see any, uh, I, re I haven't seen any test-driven development. So, you know, there's a bit of a question about regression testing, admittedly, which we'll come to uh, in the pub, perhaps. Uh, but look, we've done some early and continuous delivery of valuable software to some extent. Yeah, maybe not every two weeks, but we got a minimum viable product out. We then did some phases following that. Maybe they were three month phases, whereas otherwise waterfall, they would have been 18 months. Maybe they were four week phases, whereas otherwise it would have been six months. Um, I've, and I, I, in the previous step, I trimmed the tail. So I've avoided doing a whole load of low value stuff that we really, really didn't need, yeah? 
So those are the two things that I'm really pleased to have achieved thus far. Um, you know, maybe my, bo my releases aren't even time boxed, they're still bounded by scope. Yeah? Um, I haven't done any pair programming, I haven't done any refactoring yet, I haven't done any continuous integration, any of this, this cool, scary, agile stuff yet. But I've got a starting point for those things now because I'm already in a cycle and a habit of delivering frequently, okay? So then you can start saying, okay, well, what next? Okay, look, we're delivering every month. We've got a big burden of regression test here. Um, so we need to introduce some things. Oh, hang on, those agile guys had a good idea. Automated testing. Um, so, so maybe we could look at starting to, to do that. Uh, we've got to deliver stuff quickly, so maybe we can start thinking about reducing our documentation burden, maybe being a bit more collaborative as we, as we get there. I've not talked yet about any of the great stuff you talked about, you know, collaboration, everyone in a room. I haven't talked about any. We, we've done some of that stuff on these projects, but this has been more about you know, the phasing, the phase delivery approach. I've not really had to change behaviours too much yet. If I've been able to do those things as I went along, great. It's 5-2 now. I know it's 5-2. Nearly finished. Uh, but I've, that's not been my main focus. This kind of prioritisation, phasing, trimming the tail thing, that's been my focus. Uh, but now I'm in a great position to do some more cool stuff. So now everyone's probably gone, yeah, OK, we're doing this phasey. It's kind of looking a bit agile. We get it now. We get it now. So we can look at this more funky stuff and we start using the cool terminology. Hey, yeah, uh, let's do a retrospective. Let's, let's reflect. Let's improve. Yeah, let's continually improve. So it's the start. This is 15 steps in. It's the start of a journey. I've got one more really cool slide that I do have to show. And I'm very, uh, very uh, pleased with the, the, the political <coughs> analogy here. Okay? So um, in politics, there's this concept of the Overton window. So at any point in time, the political discourse is either you know, so far to the right or so far to the left. And there's a window around the bounds of, of what people consider to be acceptable uh, position. So... You know, the UK is probably f quite far over to the right at the minute. And so, uh, uh, what's his face? Corbyn. He looks very left-wing. He's, he's kind of out there. He's, he's probably outside of the, the political Overton window. So, again, it's, a, it's another analogy or a parallel. There's probably an Overton window for an agile transition that says you can only move a bit at a time within people's comfort zone. If you go straight to phase deliver delivery, they're like, hey, you just, you know, you, no, we don't do that here. We can't do that. You're way out of the window. But if you can go a step at a time and introduce the things as the Overton window shifts with you, then, um, then you, can, you, know, you, you, you stand a chance. Um, so I'll skip this slide because we've run out of time. But in very, very short summary, there are challenges, which I'll tell you about in the pub if you're interested. Uh, and um, uh, just reiterating, you've got the end goal in mind, but you're going a bit at a time, step by step. Each step has a benefit in its own right. Introduce the changes just at the right time. And avoid the A word. And that's it. Sorry, we ran slightly over. I had to rush a little bit at the end. Um, and we're probably a bit late for questions. But questions <laughs>